Welcome to Prigem Technologies. I am Venkat. This is part 91 of ASP.NET video series. This is continuation to part 90. If you haven't watched part 90, I would strongly encourage you to do so before continuing with the session. In this session, we'll discuss about registering a user using registration page. One of the problems with the examples that we discussed in part 90 of this video series is that we are not able to navigate to register.aspx page if we are not logged in. Let's see how to solve that problem. Now this is the application that we have been working with in part 90 of this video series. So I have this login page. Now when I navigate to this login page, I have a link here to go to the registration page. Now I don't have a username and password to log in. So obviously I want to register first and I want to get to the registration page. Look at that, when I click that, you know, I'm not able to navigate to that page unless and until I log in. This is incorrect. So let's see how to correct this problem. First, let's understand why we have this problem in place. Okay, that's because if you remember in part 90, we enabled forms authentication and then we also included this authorization element okay so we want to deny access to anonymous users okay so with this authorization setting in place the end users now will only be able to access login page okay because we have specified the login url as login.aspx so without logging in into the application you can only access now login.aspx page if you try to navigate to any other page including the register or welcome.aspx page you will be denied access you will be redirected back to login.aspx page okay so to solve this problem we can add another web.config file to this registration folder so let me right click on that add new item let me add the web.configuration file, so web.config file added to the registration folder. So in this web.config file, I'm going to include another authorization element. And here, I'm going to allow access to all users, including anonymous. So if we specify star, that means all users. So now, the settings that are present in this web.config file are applicable for all the pages within registration folder. So a user can get to register.aspx page without even logging in. So let's run the application with the setting in place and see if that has worked. So I am on the login page, press Control F5, and I can click on that link and navigate to register.aspx page. Look at that now, I am able to get to the registration page. Okay, now obviously this registration page, it's a very simple page here. You have username, password, confirm password. All these are static text and text boxes to provide those details. And when I click, when I click register button, we need to harvest these values, send them to SQL Server, and see if we should store them in a database table. Okay, and on this web form, I also have some validation controls. You know, I have used some validation controls and validation summary controls. So the user will not be able to submit the web form unless and until they provide these details. Now, if you're new to validation controls, because we are not going to discuss about validation controls now, um, we have discussed about them in, in the previous sessions of this video series. So please check those um, you know, video sessions first. So let's go to register page. So if you look at the register page, very simple HTML, those are the validation controls. So if you look at them, there are a lot of validation controls here. And then obviously, when I click this button, that's when we want to retrieve those we details and save them to the database. So first we need to create the database table. So let's flip to SQL Server Management Studio. So I want to create this TBL user table. So if you look at the table, create table TBL users, and we're gonna have four columns here. ID, username, password, and email. So ID is of type integer. That's an identity column and a primary key also for, the, for our table. And username, password, and email are of type NVACAR. Now, we have discussed about what is an identity column and how to create identity column uh, and how to create tables and stored procedures in the SQL Server video series. If you haven't watched that video series, I would strongly encourage you to watch them as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and create this table. Let's refresh the tables folder and we will have the table there. Now at the moment we don't have any rows in the table, so we have all these four columns. Now obviously we need a stored procedure as well, which will add this uh, user to the table. And to do that, I have another stored procedure here, SP register user. And if you look at this stored procedure, it's taking in three parameters. So obviously those three parameters are going to provide the values for username, 
password and email columns. Now we don't have to supply the value for ID column because that is the identity column. The values of identity column are automatically computed on the fly when the row is inserted. Okay, so we have these input parameters to the stored procedure and this is the body. Within the body we have two variables. One variable, I mean both of them are of type integer. One is called the count and the other one is return code. You will understand in a bit what those variables are for. So first what we are doing, so when we pass in a username, password and email to add to the database, now remember usernames cannot be duplicated. So if a user registers with a username Venkat, he should not be allowed to register again with the same username. So usernames have to be unique. So how do we enforce that uniqueness? We are finding, so if I get a username to be added to the table, what am I doing here? I'm writing a select query, select at count. So into this variable, I'm, I'm, I'm selecting the count of usernames where username is equal to at username. Whatever username we pass in, you know, we compare against that. If there are, you know, let's say one username already with that name, I will get that into this variable at count. Okay. So if that at count is greater than zero, then definitely we know that the username exists in the table. So in that case, we are setting the return code to minus one. On the other hand, if it's not greater than zero, then we know that it should be either equal to zero or less than zero, in which case we insert that row into the database. So we supply the values for username, password, and email, insert that into TBL users. But before that, look at the return code. We are setting that to one. So if the return code is minus one, that means you know the username exists. If it is one, the username doesn't exist, and we have successfully inserted that into this table. Okay, and finally we select that return code and give it to the .NET application. And within the .NET application, we retrieve that value and then determine what to do, depending on whether it is minus one or one. Okay, so now let's go ahead and see how to invoke this, you know, stored procedure from .NET application. So on the register page, when I click that button control, that's when we want to do that. Okay, so just to save some time, I have this ADO.NET code. Now, this code that we are going to paste here, this is not related to forms authentication. This is ADO.NET code. So if you're new to ADO.NET, we have a video series recorded on ADO.NET as well. I will have all the links for the other videos uh, within the description of this video. Um, so please check them if you haven't watched them. Okay, so um, First, let's solve these compilation errors that we see here, the syntax, I mean the compilation errors. And look at that, the first error is configuration manager class. The configuration manager class is present in system.configuration namespace. So let's import that. So system.configuration. So that should solve that error. And then SQL connection, SQL command. These classes are present in system.data.sql client namespace and that should solve the rest of the compilation errors. Okay, and command type is actually present in system.data namespace. So let's import that as well. Okay, so that should have solved all these errors. Now, what we are doing here, now the first line is interesting here, if page dot is valid. Now, if you remember on the register page, we're using validation controls. These validation controls, we have spoken about them uh, in the previous session, so please check that video sessions. But just to give you a quick overview on why we are using this page dot is valid, if you know the validation controls work both on the client side and on the server side clients can disable javascript in which case client side validation will be disabled and we want to do validation on the server side and validation controls does that automatically now if the client has disabled validation on the client side and if if some of the validation controls has failed validation then this page dot is valid property will return false so if it returns false we don't want to do anything so this block of code will not be executed. Instead, the validation error messages will be displayed to the end user. Okay, so we want to do this only if page is valid. So what are we doing here? Obviously, we are retrieving the connection string from web.config file. So if you look at the web.config file in the root directory, I have a connection string with name dbcs. So I'm pointing to my local server sample database. That's the user ID and that's the password. Okay, so we are retrieving the connection string and we are creating the connection object and the command type is SP register user and we are specifying the command type is stored procedure and we are creating 
three SQL parameter objects. Okay, and then we are associating those parameter objects with the command object using the parameters collection, open the connection, execute the command. Now we are using execute scalar because if you look at the stored procedure, it's selecting a single value. So that's why we are using execute scalar. And then execute scalar returns an object type, but we know that we are going to get an integer back. So I'm typecasting that to be of type integer, storing it in this variable. And look at that, I'm comparing. If return code is minus one, that means username is already in use. We have to choose another user name. On the other hand, otherwise, we redirect the user to the login page. So on the login page, he can enter uh, you know, his newly created username and password and then log in. Okay, so it's such a simple code there. Okay, so let me go ahead and run this application as it stands right now. Control F5. So now I don't have a username and password, so I should be able to click on this register link, get to the register page, provide the username. So let's say test. Test is the password. Test is the password. Test at test.com is the email. And I click register button. Okay, could not find stored procedure SP register user. That's because we haven't created this stored procedure yet. So let's go ahead and create that. So press F5. Now let's go back. So test is the password. Confirm password is test. Click register. Look at that. You know, it redirected me back to the login page, which means it has already added the test user. So let's quickly check if the test user is added. F5, look at that, username is test, password is test, and the email is test. Okay, that's fine. Let's try to add another user with the same username. So I'm going to add a test. Okay, I'm going to supply the same username again. Let me click register. Look at that, username already in use. Please choose another username. So everything is working fine. Everything is good, but there's one issue here. If you look at the way we are storing passwords here, we are storing them in plain text. Now, in reality, in real time, you shouldn't be storing passwords in plain text. You know, that's because of several re legislation rules as well as the organization standards. Even the administrator of the application should be, shouldn't be knowing the passwords of the other users. Okay, so we want to encrypt and store passwords. So how do we encrypt them? Uh, to encrypt, it's very easy. Um, so within the registration page, now .NET Framework has provided a method called a hash password for storing in config file. That's the name of the method. And that method is present in forms authentication class. So forms authentication is ob already uh, obviously present in system.web.security namespace. So let me go ahead and import that. And then what I want to do, if you remember, if you look at this code here, we are passing in the value for the password parameter at this line. So, and I am and I'm passing that, you know, directly by retrieving it from the password text box. Instead of that, retrieve that value, encrypt that, and then pass the encrypted value to this parameter. So how do I encrypt the password? to encrypt the password. So let's create a variable first. So encrypted password is equal to, I'm going to use the forms authentication class. So forms authentication dot, there is a method called hash password for storing in config file. And look at the return type of this method. This method takes in two parameters, the password that we want to encrypt and what is the algorithm that we want to use? You know, do we want to use SHA-1 encryption algorithm or MD5, which encryption algorithm? Okay, so where is the password present? The password is present in TXT password text box. So I'm going to retrieve that. And then I also need to specify the password format. So I'm going to use SHA-1. Okay, so that's going to encrypt the password using that algorithm and that's and return that. And we are storing that in this variable. And I'm going to use that and pass it to this parameter as a value. OK. So with this change, let's go ahead and run this. So I'm on the login page. So click here to register. So I get to the register page. So let's give another username, test1. That's the password. Confirm password. And let's say test at test.com, register. So I'm redirected. Now let's go back to the table. 
look at that the password is now encrypted it's not present in plain text format okay so so far in this video we have discussed how to register the user okay in the next video session we'll discuss about authenticating with the credentials that we have just stored now at the moment if you look at that I'll not be able to log in using test or test one because at the moment we haven't implemented. Uh, in the previous session, we actually discussed how to authenticate using the usernames and passwords that we have stored in the web.config file. But in reality, we don't really store usernames and passwords in web.config file. We store them in the database like this, and we want to be validating against this list that's present in the database instead of you know, using the list that I have in web.config file. We'll discuss about that in the next video session. On this slide, you can find resources for ASP.NET, C-Sharp, and SQL Server interview questions. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.